Hi again, it's Dwight. Today we're going to talk about the Bundesrepublik Deutschland, or the Federal Republic of Germany. Uh, Germany's highly educated workforce has made it justifiably famous for th in th technology, science, and manufacturing. Uh, folks that don't finish high school, that we would consider high school dropouts, attend what's called a Technische Hochschule. Uh, and from there they go on and work as engineers. I mean, these are what we would consider high school dropouts, and they're learning calculus on the floor of Mercedes. The majority of medium and large sized firms ha also have a interesting labor relations system called Mitbestimmung, or co-determination, where employees have automatic representation on the corporate board. Uh, Germany, along with Japan, is a strong example of a CME. Corporations in Germany are embedded in the, in the defensive networks that insulate firms from some of the vagaries of the marketplace. Uh, hostile takeovers are almost unknown in Germany. Uh, as When Lakshmi Mittal bought up uh, Arcelor Steel, which was jointly a uh, German and, and, and French interest, it led to quite an impact on the continent in that they'd never seen something like that before. Mittal made an offer, was refused, and he said, okay, I'll buy it anyways. And that's something that they hadn't seen before. Germany as a nation was first unified into a, a nation state in 1871 by Bismarck. In its various guises, it, it's had experience with imperialism, democracy, fascism, wartime devastation, division into two nations before the reunification in 1990. So it's an interesting laboratory for economic theories. Uh, in the early part of the 19th century, Napoleon forcibly united the regime into what he called the Confederation of the Rhine. Uh, but one of the provinces, Prussia, uh, grew economically and militarily strong under Bismarck, culminating a victory in the war against the Confederation and the Austrian Empire in 1886. This led to the unification of the 33 different German lender. Germany was eventually unified in 1871 following victory in the Franco-Prussian War of 1870-71. to This is significant in that Prussia led to a, a lot of modernization that we take for granted nowadays. Uh, the establishment of universal primary education was one of Bismarck's ideas. The emergence of a, a dedicated civil servants uh, you know, in, in Europe at the time. I mean, yes, the Chinese had, had it centuries before, in fact, a millennia before. But the fundamentally modern concept of abstract formal systems and government offices, that was purely a Prussian invention. Uh, what we consider bureaucracy nowadays is, is what Max Weber termed uh, the rational legal variant of bureaucracy. And he did that by studying the civil service under Bismarck and, of course, the Prussian army. Uh, Weber wrote famously about the importance of such formal institutions. He also he wrote that capitalism in Northern Europe evolved when the Protestant ethic, as he called it, influenced large numbers of people to engage in work in the secular world. The Protestant Ethic und der Geist der Kapitalismus in 1905. I think it was translated into English first in 1930 by Talcott Parsons, as I recall. Uh, basically what Weber was saying was that there are certain values that were held by the, the Northern European Protestants, such as abstemiousness, such as delayed gratification, such as you know, hard work, that one of the ways that you gained credit, if you will, towards you know, your work to, from heaven was from your good works you know, in, in this life. And those values led to part of the uh, economic growth, if you will of Northern Europe and Germany in particular. But there is a very high degree of fragmentation. As I said, at one time there were 300, or there were three, 33 different German lender, uh, each one, one of them headed up by a prince. So these principalities, you know, were a major impediment to having, you know, state growth because there was no German state until 1871. So it took a lot longer for economic development to occur in, in Germany as a whole. And its colonial economy was very small compared to uh, some of its contemporaries. I mean, remember Britain had an, had an empire where the sun never set on the British Empire, where Germany had a few 
states here and there, a few colonies that really didn't do that much for the central economy. In 1870, Germany had around 13% of, of world industrial output. The United Kingdom had 32% and the U.S. 23%. By 1913, prior to World War I, Germany had 16%. The U.K. 14% and the U.S. had 36%. So the, the ground was shifting underneath them. Bismarck also set in place uh, the beginnings of Germany's highly advanced system of social insurance and welfare, including the pioneering industrial accident insurance, health insurance, pensions, and unemployment insurance. These were very new to the world, if you recall. The Berlin Institute was a, a place of techno, technical teaching and research, it provided courses in factory management in the 1830s, well ahead of European competitors. In 1853, just five years after the opening of the historic Liverpool to Manchester Railway, a line from Nuremberg to Firth was running, so the Germans weren't letting any grass grow under their feet. Another unique feature of the German economy is the universal banks such as Deutsche Bank. Their large national scale uh, combination of commercial bank, investment bank, and investment trust. Uh, Deutsche Bank is central to a lot of very large German firms that, you know, that we know. There's cross shareholdings, uh, and Deutsche Bank sits on their corporate boards. Most of them, all of the major German banks play that kind of role for their own little corporate network. I shouldn't say little because they're, they're actually quite large. Uh, with long time scales for collecting return on investment, uh, this patient capital as it's termed, uh, Banks and industrial firms form these alliances, you know, that have continued to this day. And it's a defining feature, if you will, of German capitalism. Uh, patient capital from banks as long-term investors are called Hausbanken, uh, house banks, protected by an intricate system of co corporate shareholdings. So what this does is allow the companies, you know, to look towards the long term. They're not really worried about their quarterly returns. On the downside, it tends to make them slightly risk averse. Uh, powerful corporations were also built on very strong craft uh, traditions, you know, the, the, the craft guilds, where you go, I mean, an engineer goes and becomes, you know, uh, an apprentice engineer, becomes a journeyman engineer, eventually, you know, becomes a master. That high degree of training and dedication to craft ex expertise means less need for managerial supervision because, you know, what would you be, if you were a supervisor, what would you be telling a master craftsman? Just do your job faster? Uh, that wouldn't get you very far. They're a master for a reason. Uh, Germany also developed large-scale industrialization because of this, faster than the UK and France, and achieved this without sacrificing its, its, its traditional craft practices. Germany, cu German customs and laws have long tolerated and even encouraged forms of interfirm collaboration that would be illegal under Teddy Roosevelt's antitrust legislation in the US. So you see that these features of contemporary German capitalism, you know, were, were set you know, in place well over a century and a half ago. By the turn of the 20th century, the German Reich was amongst the world's foremost economic powers. Uh, unfortunately, this eventually led to World War I. Uh, it, was, it was essentially an imperialist contest, according to your author. I, I remember in my high school's history text, it was called, you know, the rise of the nation state. Uh, Garibaldi had reunited, you know, the, the Italian principalities. We now had the Austro-Hungarian Empire. We had the British Empire. We had the, you know, the, the, the German Reich rising. Uh, and that competition for resources and for power, if you will, pretty much led to the inevitability of World War I. Uh, an excellent book on that would be Barbara Tuckman's The Guns of August, uh, where these people thought they could read each other's strategies, you know, so well that it actually led them into stumbling into war. Post-World War I, uh, the Treaty of Versailles uh, imposed truly vindictive terms on Germany. Roughly 80% of its iron ore, 44% of pig iron capacity, 36% of steel capacity through the Saar-Ruhr region, the Alsace and Lorraine going back to France, and 32% of world steel capacity all disappeared 
as a result of the treaty. So it crippled Germany economically. So what happened between the wars, the, the interwar chaos, uh, the royal family abdicated after the, the war, and in the 1920s were a decade of mostly deep crisis for the new German Democratic Republic. Uh, the Reichsmark was destroyed by hyperinflation. There's these wonderful news, I shouldn't call them wonderful, these scary newsreel videos, and there's some photographs of people showing up at the bakery with a wheelbarrow full of Deutschmarks to buy a loaf of bread. Uh, the exchange rate in June 1918 was around 8 marks to $1. In December 10, uh, 1921, it was 122 marks. By the end of 1922, it was 7,600 marks to the dollar, and a year later, it was 4.2 trillion marks to the dollar. By December 1923, wholesale prices were 656 billion times higher than in 1918. Hyperinflation destroyed Germany, destroyed the German economy, and indirectly or directly led to the, the rise of fascism. The Dawes Plan of, of, of 1924, sponsored by the U.S., uh, canceled some of the reparations because it realized that you really don't want to have the German uh, Republic sitting around going, well, what's our alternative here? We're bankrupt. We may as well go back, you know, to fighting the French. The Weimar Republic introduced some important social policies in an effort to give some ground to workers' demands and also to preempt, you know, the spread of communism, which was... Uh, rampant in Europe at the time. Remember the 1917 Russian Revolution had everybody in Europe scared. The Wall Street crash of 1929 was especially devastating for Germany as the U.S. kind of turned off the tap. The Germans were dependent upon U.S. loans primarily for their for rebuilding. And with the, with the Wall Street crash, those were no longer forthcoming. So what happened was we had a re-energized uh, strongly extremist right, and of course the communist-affiliated left-wing parties gained ground. There was frequent street violence between the various factions. One of these extremist groups was Adolf Hitler's National Socialist Party. Uh, and we know more about that, but we will talk more. Unemployment rose to a staggering height of 33% in 1932 and 33. And when you have one-third of the people sitting home it's a recipe for an uprising. Great concern among many circles in, in Germany, particularly among the uh, industrial elite, that Bolshevik-style revolution, a German October, could break out in, you know, in the very homeland of, of Karl Marx. Senior political figures uh, actually supported the appointment of Hitler as chancellor because uh, his party was the strongest, and naively they thought they could control the nascent Nazi party. That turned out to be one of the gravest uh, mis misunderstandings in, in world history. Uh, they really couldn't control Hitler, as we well know. So with Stalin's rise in the USSR and Hitler's in Germany, this is truly the 20th century's darkest period. Uh, you had monsters in charge of a big chunk of, of, of uh, the Eurasian continent. The economic model of the Third Reich gambled everything on pu putting military expansion first. It was a... a a rebuilding economy, but it was going to rebuild the military first in order to project power and, and prestige. There was also this idea of synchronization, Gleichschaltung, uh, uh, involving development of a command economy. Uh, one of the hallmarks of fascism is that government and business firmly get in bed together. Industrial groups were increasingly subjected to political control as Nazi economic policy built and intensified long ten there was this long standing trend towards cartelization and what the what the Nazis did was just make that uh, part of the law and not just a trend the state enforced capital controls engaged in currency manipulation and controlled wages and prices which never works in the long term but in the short run can be quite effective trade unions were crushed and replaced with official german labor front the deutsche arbeitsfront basically they were all uh, offshoots of, of the Nazi party. So, you know, you, you worked in, a, in an organization that was affiliated with the government and your union was part of the Nazi party. In the end, however, Hitler's 12,000, Hitler's thousand-year Reich lasted 12 and a half years. 
fortunately, but it was probably 12 and a half years too long. Uh, at the end of World War II, uh, the U.S. took a, upon itself a much more active role in trying to develop the German economy and political system. Uh, and in fact, in, indeed, in, indeed, helping to rebuild German or uh, European capitalism and social and, and, and political order. The ascendance of the German post-war so, social economic model though, is called the Wirtschaftswunder. Uh, at the end of the Second World War, Germany was divided into four occupational zones under the influence of the UK, France, USA, and the USSR. And the capital of Germany, Berlin, was further divided into four economic zones. Uh, the famous Checkpoint Charlie, which I've passed through, went from the American zone into uh, the Russian zone, uh, or East Germany. So the USA helped to reconstruct West Germany in its own image, while the East Germany became a client state of the USSR. The German Democratic Republic uh, became a model Soviet-style uh, system and became the most advanced system of its type in, well, in fact, ever. Uh, one thing that people don't recall is that at the time of unification in 1990, East Germany was the 20th largest economy in the world. Uh, and I've long opined that if the Germans couldn't make communism work, nobody could. And even the East Germans couldn't. So, But this included the establishment of a command economy, collectivization of agriculture, which has always been a failure, five-year plans, and the insertion of price and wage controls. In common with Soviet-style systems of a command economies, uh, there was a one-party state and strict forms of social and political control. The infamous Staatspolizei, the Stasi, had one in five East Germans were on its books as working for it as agents or informers. I uh, found it quite fascinating and deeply scary that upon reunification, the, f the files of the Stasi were thrown open to the German citizenry. And you go down to the archives and find out that it was, you know, your daughter that turned in your your father uh, to, to, this, uh, to the Staatspolizei. That within your own family, you weren't safe to have political opinions. The planned economy ran into chronic difficulties in the 1980s and was later to collapse. A key element of U.S. influence over Germany and Western Europe was the so-called Marshall Plan, after General George Marshall, who administered it. Provided around $13 billion U.S. in reconstruction loans, aid, and expertise to the nations of Western Europe. Uh, U.S. influence over Germany extended to the very highest levels of U.S. diplomacy. It was, it was a key tenet of, of Americanism or American foreign policy to rebuild Germany and make it a successful democracy. And there was also this competition that was starting up, the, the, the nascent era of the Cold War that uh, America felt that it had to make Germany work as a counterpoint to East Germany. That if West Germany wasn't working and East Germany was, it would make capitalism look rather weak. The U.S. occupation attempted to decartelize you know, the industry because of U.S. Uh, ideas of antitrust. That didn't work really well. Uh, the changes were largely resisted by German bankers who believed their, in their historic version of, of universal banking and the way they organized things. Uh, also, interestingly, developed the reestablishment of works councils in the rear iron and steel industry was influenced by the British occupational force and became, you know, a bit more militant, shall we say, like British trade unions tended to be. However, it was also designed to preempt communist influence uh, to keep the communist unions out. Just over 80% of workplaces were covered by collective bargaining. Uh, but in a, a situation that largely persisted until 1990 and unification, when it fell to about 60% today. This idea of Mitbestimmung restored tradi Germany's traditional dual system of management, executive committee, and supervisory board. Uh, the unions do have a defined number of seats on the corporate board. <coughs> West Germany became a, a high tax regime, supporting very well def developed systems of social welfare to protect the weaker, and also subsidized industry and agriculture. The, subs the, the agricultural subsidies are a trademark of, of uh, European economic policy today. 
West German economic growth, like that of Japan, was described as a miracle, uh, as I said, a Wirtschaftswunder. Annual GDP growth was around 5% between 1950 to 1973, which is truly amazing. Germany's export rose from 9% of national income in 1950 to 19% by 1960. The West German economic boom was, to a large extent, a nationally controlled regime of organized capitalism and quite successful. The post-war phase in Germany is truly the most successful of any of the countries in Europe. And eventually, Germany gained economic superiority in relation to UK and France. And even today is, you know, is the most successful economy in Europe, as Angela Merkel uh, reminds her compatriots from time to time. Germany has a social and market philosophy called ordo-liberalism, uh, which differed considerably from the more liberal American economic model, but doesn't share quite the same features as the French model of, of, uh, of derechism. De Keynesian demand management programs were put in place and was a, was a macro, uh, macroeconomic policy option of the West German governments from the 60s and 70s. Growth held steady, as we pointed out, uh, until dropping back sharply to around 1.6% from 1973 to 2000. But of course, those winds of change had the same origin as everyone else's. Uh, it was that external economic shock of, of, of the various Arab oil shocks which caused you know, the foundations of the Keynesian consensus to start to crumble. Unemployment became an issue in the 70s, with the number of unemployed climbing to around 6 million by the early 2000s. In 1980s, Helmut Kohl, the chancellor, fa uh, fa faced a three-year recession, adopted some of the shift to the, to the right, that it was occurring in uh, Germ in, in the UK and, and the US. Uh, it was called Die Wende, the turn, but never on a scale approaching Thatcher. As the German economy recovered, though, those traditional features not only reasserted themselves, but also appeared to, to many as strengths. There were many books written in the 80s and 90s about the German economic system and how it was the, one of the best ways to run an industrial economy. In. I would tend to agree with that, that Germany and Japan still truly understand how to run an industrial economy. The problem arises is that we're moving to post-industrial economies. So that patient capital uh, led to economic development, under which, and there's a sense of trust between labor and management that underlies that. The German state spent around 7% of GDP on education and training, including spending on schools, apprenticeships, vocational training. And, of course, German post-war reconstruction and growth have led to peace in Europe for a long period of time. The next seminal event, of course, occurred on November 11th, 1989. I remember it quite well. The demise of the Berlin Wall, which, uh, when I visited it, I thought was one of the ugliest constructions ever. Next, of course, to the concentration camps, which I also visited. But the wall was just a scar. Uh, in my view. When the wall fell, the second era of globalization began. At that night, at that point, when East Germans took it upon themselves to travel through the checkpoints and visit West Berlin. Uh, the West German strong economic performance running into difficulties that were associated with this uh, reunification. In fact, I would argue that no other country in the world would, be, would even have attempted to do what Germany did. Although hopefully we'll see it someday with the Koreas. Uh, that the unification of East and West was a massive economic project that probably cost 20% of Germany's GDP and has so ever since 1990. But basically, the Germans attempted to transport the entire Western apparatus to the East. And what they found when they went across the border <coughs> into the former Eastern lender was that as good as the East German economy was, it was hollow. The factories you know, that, they, that they tried to buy and, and incorporate into their German uh, economic model pretty much had to be bulldozed and torn down because it was half-century-old technology. Uh, that was pretty much useless in a modern economy. So, 
According to Der Spiegel, a uh, German news magazine, the federal government subsidized the new eastern lender, lender is a state, uh, by about 70 to 80 billion euros a year, and that's continuing. It's been a huge economic cost and has contributed to some of the slowdown in growth because you got East, West Germany growing at a very high rate, East Germany, uh, we got to bring them back to something resembling normality. And that inevitably is going to lead to a decline in growth. Uh, nowadays, senior management in major German corporations is increasingly tending towards an Anglo-Saxon model. Uh, so the idea of corporate control is no longer settled. Uh, corporate takeovers are possible. They're not as, uh, off, they don't occur as often as they would in the UK or the US, but they do occur. And German companies are increasingly being held up to the idea of market uh, supervision. Union density, collective bargaining, been falling significantly since the 80s. And Mitbestimmung is in deeper trouble than probably ever before because it's sometimes seen as an impediment to change. Privatizations have occurred at a faster pace than ever before. The German government is largely getting out of the economic business. The, even the much admired German uh, education system is up for its share of criticism. The German universities' uh, degrees take too long. And for example, you know, I, I teach in, in I teach in a master's program. MBA programs are a very late thing coming to Germany. Uh, most German universities still don't have you know specific business education. But American style MBAs are coming. The solidity of Model Deutschland is, is more uncertain than before, yet it retains some of its, you know, its particular character. The social market economy, as they call it, remains a fairly powerful concept among political elites and, and is supported by all political parties. Between 1997 to 2010, industry's share of German GDP moved up from 20 to 21 percent, while in the UK it went from 18 to 13 percent. Seems be, the Germans seem to be much more comfortable with industrial engineering than they do with financial engineering. Uh, despite its struggles, notably in the Eastern Lender, Germany remains a very powerful economy, uh, largely has you know, control of large parts of Europe through their, the power of, the, of their economy. Uh, giving up the Deutschmark for the Euro was probably, in retrospect, one of the smartest moves they ever made. Uh, Germany, on some levels, has clearly moved on from its model of organized capitalism towards a more disorganized form, but will probably never, you know, become as, as uh, free market driven as the UK, Europe, or Australia. As it comes to the future, I'm not worried about Germany. Uh, the German economy is powering along as it always does, and as we saw in the recent uh, debacle over uh, the, the, the Greek bailout. Germany is firmly in control of Europe's economic destiny and will remain to be so for the decades to come. Well, that's all I have to say for now. Thanks for listening, and we'll talk again very soon. Bye-bye.